Right, welcome to our latest uh, EBS webinar today. Um, my name is Simon G. Um, I'm one of the business development managers at EBS. Um, today we are joined by one of our key partners, um, James Egginson from Sonic Wall. Uh, before James begins, for those that are not aware, EBS is soon to celebrate 40 years in business, so that's a nice um, starting point today. And really, we want to continue to focus on being your experienced technology partner. Um, this webinar will be recorded, by the way, and uploaded to our YouTube channel. So please, if I can ask you to remain on mute and turn your videos off. Um, if you do have any questions through the session, please just pop them in the chat on the right hand side um, and we'll answer those in due course. Um, we're probably expecting this session to, to run for about 30 minutes or so. Um, so I think without further ado, let's hand over to James and we're going to discuss how not to become a statistic. Um, and safeguard your network against cyber criminals. So I'm going to mute myself for the moment to take myself off on uh, video and um, I'll leave it with you, James. Thanks, Simon. I appreciate the intro. Um, so guys, hi, my name is James Eggington. Um, I'm a channel account manager here at SonicWall. I've been with the business now for about two and a half years. And prior to that, I was in uh, security distribution uh, for four or five years. So hopefully, I'm well rounded um, and can kind of give you a, a steer on what's happening in the cyber industry at the moment, some key trends, um, and then also touching on the Sonic Wall portfolio as well, how that can assist you with your requirements. Um, and as Simon said, make sure you're not one of those statistics um, kind of moving forwards. Let me just share my screen. If someone can just confirm that they can see it, I'll crack on. James, yes, I can see that. Good stuff. Perfect, cool. So yeah, as I mentioned, um, I'm going to run through uh, the uh, threat report, uh, touch on a little bit about um, kind of who we are as a business, um, the technology that behind all of our products, because I think once you grasp that kind of technology and the security piece, it overlays our entire portfolio. Um, so it's really key to kind of understand that aspect. But first and foremost, before we kind of get into the threat report, you know, what's happening in the world at the moment? You know, this is kind of really where we're sitting um, and where our industry is and probably what you're seeing on a day to day basis. So this is the cybersecurity industry against the cybercrime industry. And as you can see, us as an industry, EBS, Sonic Wall um, and kind of the cyber side of things, we're massively outweighed. Um, a couple of years ago, cybercrime was market market value of about five trillion. I think up to date figures are about eight and a half, nine trillion dollars. Um, that currently makes it the third largest economy in the world behind the US uh, and China. So huge, huge um, footprint globally. A um, couple of years time, that's estimated to be 10 trillion. I think we'll be at 10 trillion by the end of the year, if I'm honest with you. Um, and these guys are all about greed, um, disruption. They're after monetary gains. They're here to basically disrupt your business and steal your money. Um, they're very, very focused and really gone are the days of, you know, looking at a cyber criminal as someone that sits in their room with their hood up um, trying to be disruptive and trying to hack into websites that that kind of picture is gone what we're now seeing are really really sophisticated outfits um, you know i haven't been on the dark web but um, i've been told that you know these cyber crime organizations have hr departments you know they're offering huge amounts of money and drop for jobs uh, with job descriptions um, they're incredibly sophisticated outfits these days and are global, totally untraceable. So from that perspective, you really need to make sure you have adequate resources and security in place to protect yourselves against these guys. Um, and then just touching on the cybersecurity side of things, right now we're about 220 billion um, market value. Um, as of today, uh, that's ever growing, you know, double digit growth year on year. Us as a vendor, we see double digit growth year on year. Lots of other vendors and lots of other security partners and providers um, are growing rapidly. It's a real buzzword. You know, um, most people nowadays know what ransomware is, know what cyber is, know what security is. It's quite a, it's quite a hot topic. Um, and essentially, we're here to help you as an organization protect yourselves. Um, we understand that it's very confusing. There are lots of layers these days, you know, gone at a 10 years ago where you had a firewall, you had some endpoint protection, probably Norton um antivirus and off you went and that was kind of sufficient now you've got environments you know you might be hybrid you might be fully cloud you might be you know 
have a remote workforce and essentially you know you might have a, a small IT team to manage all of those complexities so we're here to kind of assist you with that um, provide you with really good uh, security that's that's proven in terms of threat detection and is easy to manage um, and affordable you know there, there are kind of three pillars as such so later on I'll describe how we do that as uh, as a vendor kind of specifically um, but moving forwards into the next slides there we go I suppose this is kind of what we're seeing at the moment and this is the reality so COVID a few years ago created an explosion of exposure points prior to that everyone was behind you know a corporate firewall they're in the office in the building nice and safe now you've got remote working I mean I'm sat here in our distributor in Stoke um, in their office but I'm still tapped into the corporate network you know still accessing all the corporate data I'm here on teams you know how do we make those links secure um, so you know you guys as a business can 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 be safe and 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 kind of go about your day-to-day -day business cost you know these these types of solutions are quite expensive and to have full coverage is really really difficult I think a couple of years ago I heard a stat that the average enterprise organization deploys 75 different security um, services security products to secure its network you know potentially that could be 75 different vendors different products different specializations uh, different training courses different certifications you know it becomes incredibly comp complex and very difficult to manage so you need a big IT team to obviously help you with that um, which only increases the costs um, but actually from what we're seeing and and you know this might resonate with yourselves on the call is those budgets and those headcounts are actually quite restricted so you've got a small IT team managing a huge amount of work um, and your budgets are, are potentially decreasing or staying the same for IT or cyber um, so what that's getting you in in terms of solutions now compared to a few years ago um, leaves you with you know some some patches and some vulnerabilities in your network and this is what we call the cybersecurity business gap so us as a vendor we like to come in um, we've got multi multi products um, a wide portfolio that captures everything from your network security through to cloud endpoint you know office 365 for cloud application uh, cloud application security um, amongst other things so all of that can be managed in a single pane of glass console reducing the complexities reducing the training the certification and the people required to manage those different solutions i'll now touch on uh kind of the threat report so this is something we would release every six months so we've just released our uh, mid-year threat report literally hot off the press about a week ago uh, so these are really really up-to-date stats um, about what's happening in the world in terms of threats ransomware malware intrusion attempts um, that our devices see so we've got about a million sensors a million devices out there globally um, and they're all pinging back to our database which is what we call capture labs um, and all of that data is cleverly put together uh, by our capture labs team and every six months we rep reproduce uh, a threat report for you guys to understand what's happening in the, in the industry what's happening globally and you know you can utilize that in a number of different ways uh, but it's it's essentially there for an education piece um, and potentially for you guys to you know um, allocate your projects and and kind of resources accordingly moving forwards so as a top level stat Kind of mid-year wise i'll i'll um kind of rush over these um quickly on this slide because the the following slides go into them in a little bit more detail um potentially surprisingly for you guys um ransomware is down down 41 percent um last year it reduced 21 percent year on year so that's quite a significant decrease over the over a few uh over, over a few years i'll go into some details as to why that is malware attacks are, uh, are down um Malware is kind of a group of threats, I suppose. So you've got things in there like crypto jacking, IoT, encrypted threats. They kind of all fall under the malware family as such. But as you can see, you know, crypto jacking up nearly 400% um, year on year. Um, IoT malware, Internet of Things up massively, encrypted threats up massively. So, you know, different areas and different threats are increasing um, across the board. 
Um, so from that perspective, you know, there is a real need to, to be secure across a number of different platforms in a number of different areas. We'll touch on ransomware first. Um, so down 41% year to date. Um, this is something that, you know, like I mentioned earlier, if you're talking to friends, family, you know, general public, if you see it in the news, you'll see ransomware attacks. These are probably the most common and the most captured threats uh, for, for news articles. Um, and because it's down is, is, is quite surprising. Um, but this is really all about perspective. 2021 was a record breaker for ransomware. Um, and, you know, we saw huge, huge, huge volumes, huge attacks, really, really disruptive attacks. Um, and that was kind of a, an anomaly as such. If you look back to kind of the 2020 volumes, we're about there now. So, so what we're seeing is kind of back to the norm, I suppose, of, of ransomware volumes. Um, and again, this is about perspective. So, you know, the other threats that we're seeing are increasing massively and ransomware is decreasing because, you know, these attacker groups are putting their efforts and putting their time um, into creating malware that's a little bit easier to push out. You know, we call it the spray and pray um, uh, style of attacks, you know, email attacks, phishing attacks, really, really simple to blast out to a big database of email addresses, for example, whereas ransomware is a little bit more sophisticated. It takes time to create, it takes time to deploy. Um, and if it's not successful, you know, that's a huge amount of wasted time. So what we're seeing is it's just diversified away from ransomware into other, other kind of threat vectors. Where the UK sits on this, um, I'll take the slide with a little pinch of salt. We are a US-based company. Um, so the majority of our customers are US-based. We've got a big, big foothold in the US. Um, but as you can see, the UK is, is, still, is still up there, you know, as, as, as the third most attacked country uh, globally. Germany second, obviously. Um, and this is all around kind of a number of different things, actually. You think of, you think of the UK as a nation, you know, the economic changes that we've been going through recently, Brexit a few years ago, the political uncertainty, we've had numerous prime minister changes over the years, um, you know, meaning different directions, different regulation changes. Um, and you think of the types of organisations we have here, you know, large data centres, huge enterprises, um, you know, NHS, there's a huge amount of personal data there that can be tapped into and is really, really valuable for these, um, uh, for these attacker groups and these cyber criminals. So for us, you know, that's always, we're always going to be a target and we're always going to be up there. Um, but ransomware itself, in terms of volume, I think is going to drop and that's going to diversify into kind of other threats moving forwards. I mentioned uh, malware. So, you know, malware um, you know, down 8% year to date. Um, again, volume is still very, very high when you compare it to, to ransomware. So these attacks are, are kind of, you know, a little bit more, um, I suppose, legacy is probably the right word. So, you know, your more traditional attra attacks like, you know, your phishing um, attacks, your emails with malicious links, attachments. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, this is diversifying away from that ransomware piece, which is really sophisticated into something that's dead easy to send out um, from, from an attacker group. So, you know, they're hitting a hell of a lot more um, email addresses, lots more users, um, and their catch rate, therefore, is, is, is bigger because of it. Um, and the UK ranks fourth in the world in terms of um, kind of route, uh, malware hits, which again kind of relates nicely to the to the previous slide with ransomware. So we are a very very targeted uh, nation. Crypto jacking. So for those who haven't heard of crypto jacking before, it's essentially where um, an attacker uh, will try and seize um, computing power or network power um, from an end user uh, from a customer to utilize that power to mine cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, um, XRP and all of those uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, the only way you'll see or detect this if you haven't got a solution like SonicWall uh, will be um, you know, a, a, a slow network or a bottleneck network, um, a reduced speed. You know, it will be bottlenecking. It will be incredibly slow. Um, having SonicWall there, we identify it. As it's coming in, we see it, we block it, and it never reaches your network. But you know, crypto jacking in terms of volumes and attack attacks um, is incredibly popular with with uh, cyber criminals. Linking back to kind of what I mentioned earlier around you know these guys are based on the dark web, so 
what do they purchase with? What do they use as money? They use cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are untraceable. Um, they can make purchases on the dark web. They're, they're anonymous. So these guys can really continue under the radar and survive as an organization um, because these guys are, are you know, big corporates now. These guys are organizations, they're sophisticated. Um, and in terms of these attacks, they're obviously going up massively, 399% up year to date. So a huge, huge volume there. Um, and as I mentioned, yeah, they, nav they navigate around those sanctions. They navigate around the fact that they can't use kind of your standard um, money to, to purchase things. So they'll use that crypto um, to do so. And encrypted threats. So uh, this is malware over HTTPS. Um, so if you if you're on your browser, if you've got um, you know, a little kind of padlock on your on your browser site, on your on your search bar, um, you know that that website is a is a is an encrypted um, is an encrypted site. This is really really popular for um, hackers to essentially tap into um, and try and hack into your network. It sounds secure, encrypted. Uh, but unless you've got um, tools like DPI SSL or TLS decryption turned on, um, you're not actually monitoring and encrypting that traffic. So TLS decryption, DPI SSL, they both mean the same things. Essentially, they unpack it, that website or that link. They'll look at it, understand if anything there is malicious. If there's not, we'll pack it up, give it a certificate and say, this is good to go. And you know you can carry on viewing that website browsing the website um, and continuing on your day to day stuff. Um, it's incredibly difficult to, to do this without those types of tools and those those resources and, and um, security features turned on. Um, they do require a little bit more performance once they are turned on and a little bit of, I suppose, mothering and, and nurturing to make sure that they're um, that they're working correctly. That's absolutely fine across the board. You know, we're not the only vendor uh, that that you would need to do that with if you're turning on dpi ssl tls decryption across any different vendor it will take some time to nurture that and make sure it's um it's it's clear and up to speed um and as i mentioned it takes up more performance so you know that links back to is your firewall capable um we've in the past 18 months released a set of um firewalls our generation 7 firewalls so if you're a legacy sonic wall customer and you've got our generation 6 you're looking at about a three times increase on the performance of your firewalls uh, generation to generation. Doesn't mean we're charging three times as much. They're very affordable and you can obviously purchase them via our secure upgrade program for loyalty with SonicWall or competitive displacement. Um, and that gives you three times the performance to turn on features like DPI SSL, making sure you've got all your security features turned on um, and making sure you as an organization are secure. And IoT. So IoT stands for Internet of Things. Uh, really interesting topic. This, um, you know, go back 15, 20 years. IoT probably wasn't even a thing. You know, now we have smart fridges, smart kettles, anything connected to Wi-Fi, anything connected to the internet is is deemed as IoT. And even in the office, you think of you know CCTV cameras, um, anything like that that you have that's hooked up to to, to Wi-Fi and has internet connection would be deemed IoT. Even things, you know, on uh, employee desks that are plugged in, um, you know, plug and plays in terms of um, you know devices, anything like that that they're that they're connecting up into the internet. Um, you know, nowadays that makes up a huge amount of of, of what's of what's on a network. Um, but that doesn't mean that IT managers can see this. And I'm sure there's people on the call that that um, would struggle for visibility on, on what's actually plugged into their network and what they're actually seeing and 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 what's what's attaching to their to their network as such. Um, I think over the next couple of years, you know, we're going to see um, big implementation and, and big pressure on IoT vendors to um, have some stronger controls, whether that's encryption or kind of basic hardening of, of those devices to make sure that there's security on them. Um, at the moment, like I mentioned, they're just default. They come out of the box, you plug them in, connect them up to the internet and off you go. Um, but actually, um, they need some kind of security on there, um, especially in an office environment or a corporate environment. A um, couple of examples, I think it was 2017. It's quite a good or bad example, depending on how you look at it. But um, 
out in the States in Vegas, uh, there's uh, a large casino and they had an enormous fish tank behind their reception. And that fish tank was controlled, uh, had filter controls and temperature controls built into it, but there were smart controls. So they hooked up to the internet. There was a guy on his phone that, you know, got a notification if the temperature went up too high or the filter was getting blocked, et cetera. Um, and a hacker was able to hack into the network of the casino by the fish tank. They had a totally flat network. They hadn't segmented off business critical against non-business critical assets. Um, so once the guy was in, he had access to everything. He had keys to the kingdom. There were um, customer uh, details on there, bank details, uh, employee details, everything he had um, literally at his disposal. Um, he was able to put a ransomware attack on them. Um, ransom was millions and millions of dollars. Being a casino, they were able to obviously pay that and continue on as usual. But, you know, this can impact any organization. Um, you know, if you're a small organization, a handful of users, um, if you haven't got that cash in the bank to obviously pay these these hackers, um, you know, that's going to have huge detrimental effects to your to your business. So, yeah, it's really, really important to have visibility of everything that's going on to your network. And I think moving forwards over the next few years, we will see a shift in IoT and smart devices having some kind of hardening or encryption on there. And that's really it in terms of high level for the for the threat report. Um, if you scan the QR code, you can download a copy of our threat report. Um, it's out now. If you um, can't for whatever reason scan the um, scan the QR code, you just type in sonnetwall.com slash threat report. You'll be able to download an executive summary or the full report, which is about 60, 70 pages full of information um, on the on the state of cyber at the moment. So I'll now move away from kind of what's happening in the world and, and kind of what we're seeing based on our threat report and into into why Sonic Wall and kind of who we are and how we protect customers. Um, we obviously partner with EBS. EBS are a longstanding Sonic Wall uh, Sonic Wall partner, um, and they've got a really slick managed service um, that the end users can tap into. Um, so complete management of the of the device, um, and 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 they can take advantage of all of what you see on the screen now. So all of the, all of the security pieces, all of the management pieces, and then from a cost perspective. We have a very low total cost of ownership. So from a know the unknown perspective and a technology perspective, um, we utilize and deploy our technology, which is called Capture ATP. And we've got a patented technology called RTDMI, which stands for real time deep memory inspection. And I'll go over those in the next few slides, but that is essentially the backbone of all of our solutions. Um, it's layered across every single product that we sell. Um, and it's incredibly slick and incredibly good in terms of threat detection and also management, which links me on to nicely to the visibility and control aspect. So, you know, you've got this great technology. If you can't utilize it and you're not understanding it and you can't interpret it and change um, policies and, and, and kind of, you know, see alerts, et cetera, what's, what's, what's the use on it? So we, we have stuff called um, Capture Security Center, um, and a solution called Network Security Manager, which is a nice overlay to our firewalls. And essentially that provides improved management, improved reporting and improved analytics. So you really get an idea of what's happening on your network um, uh, and, and you can make decisions and, and, and obviously you know, change management from there. And all of this doesn't come at a huge cost. We've got a very low total cost of ownership when you compare us to our competition. Um, you know, firewalling is, is um, kind of where we sit in security as a competitive market. We've got a long standing um, relationship with our partners and we've been in business for about 33 years. Um, so from that perspective, you know, we've got a great foothold in the market. Um, just touching on kind of our foothold, I suppose, one in four SMB firewalls in the UK. So any organization under 150 users utilizes a Sonic wall and that grows to 28% globally for SMBs. Um, utilizing a sonic wall so you know we've got a great footprint in that um, in that market and we really support a huge amount of SMB organizations um, with their devices with their security and not only just the network security but across the board with cloud um, you know, cloud application security and then kind of moving into the access points and you know your endpoint email security as well so this builds out quite nicely so this in a nutshell 
is is Sonic War as such. So, you know, we've got our capture labs, which is our essentially database full of known information. Um, this is built up over 30 years. Everything we've caught, everything that we deem malicious feeds back to this database. It's got trillions and trillions of lines of code in there that we um, that end users utilize to block um, block malicious activity with. Um, and we share that with a number of different security vendors um, to make sure it's totally up to date. And this equates for 99% of everything that we see that's malicious. So this is just signature-based matching against something that we know, something that we've seen, um, and we block it so it doesn't get onto your network. But that 1%, it doesn't sound like a huge amount, but it only takes one attack to get through onto your network uh, to have you know disruption and, and potentially, you know, um, monetary implications. So we utilize a multi-engine sandbox. For those of you that aren't aware of sandboxing technologies, it's essentially a safe place that we can you know, open an email, open an attachment, open a link. That's not going to affect you um, as an end user. It's not going to affect your network. We'll check it, repackage it up. And if it's safe, we'll obviously deliver it onto the network once it's gone through the other checks. Um, and if it's malicious, we'll block it and not allow it onto your network. Most vendors will have a sandboxing solution. We've got a three-tiered sandboxing solution. And essentially that just provides you lots of different angles, uh, lots of different eyes um, to make sure you're getting the, the most um, coverage and, and a clear idea of whether something in there is malicious. Running in tandem to that, as I mentioned earlier, is, is something that's patented to Sonic Wall. It's real-time deep memory inspection. And essentially it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it, it inspects, um, potential malicious activity, malicious malware, malicious, malicious code, deep in memory. So hackers are becoming increasingly clever now and they're writing code specifically to avoid uh, advanced threat protection, you know, like sandboxing and lots of other different, uh, different technologies. So we look in memory to understand actually, is there code there that's trying to fool this, the sandbox solution? And if it is, Let's have a look in memory to understand whether um, whether there is something deep in the file or deep in the code that that is malicious. So we're covering it from a huge amount of different angles and at a really, really deep level. Essentially, if we find something that's malicious, we'll block until verdict. Um, so this is prior to the scans happening. We won't ever allow anything onto your network unless it's deemed safe. If it's bad and we find something in there that's malicious and it's brand new, never before seen, uh, we'll feed it back into our capture labs and within 24 hours, that specific code um, will be across every single Sonic call globally. So what you're buying into with Sonic call isn't just a, a static piece. It's not a stateful firewall. You've got the next generation piece to, to be constantly evolving and constantly changing um, and it's constantly being updated. So, you know, it's not just anything that, ca that your firewall catches. If something in Australia catches a, a, a really a powerful unknown threat within 24 hours your firewall will have that uh, signature to match and, and 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 block against and obviously if it's good we'll deliver it and all of this can be seen through that single pane of glass uh, for visibility control so if it gets stopped at any point you can understand why who it was targeting why when it was stopped um and you can pull reports and visibility and and analytics you know if you're presenting to board members for example um you know, this is a great tool to just pull off a PDF um, and, and obviously display the value that Sonic Wall is, is, is providing your organization. But don't just take my word for it. Um, we rely on independent testers to test our equipment just to make sure that what we're saying uh, is true. Um, and all of our um, claims and all of our statistics and all of our technologies are working as they should do. So we utilize um, and we work with the ICSA labs, which is a, a, an arm of Verizon. Um, and they provided, um, sorry, we provided them with one of our mid-tier firewalls, an NSA, uh, I believe it was a 2700 at the time. We gave it to them with all of our security solutions and all of our um, technology turned on. And they threw for a quarter, you know, unknown, known, little known uh, malware at it, just to see if, you know, if what we're saying is true. Um, it came out with a 100% perfect score. So it came out with 100% detection of threats, both unknown and known, and zero false positives. Fast forward eight quarters, so two years, they've got exactly the same firewall, um, and they're still throwing tests at it on a quarterly basis. Um, and we've got 100% detection of threats still, and we've got one false positive, which hopefully you'll forgive us for. 
Um, but from that side of things, you can really see the, the effectiveness of our solution, but also the accuracy as well. So nothing is getting onto your network that shouldn't. Um, and from a management perspective, you're not having to trawl through lines and lines of false positives, potentially having to release the odd email. Uh, um, it doesn't leave you questioning whether your solution is doing the right job or not. From this, you know, with a sonic wall, it absolutely is. I'll run through our portfolio very, very quickly, but you know, if you've ever heard of us before, it's probably to do with our firewalling. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a, a strong foothold in the SMB market with the firewalls, um, and that would relate to our TZ and NSA range. Um, NSA, you're kind of looking at, you know, you know, the thousand users and above. You know, it's great for educational organisations. And then you've got our NSSP range, which is for your data centres and, and you know, your large enterprises. Um, but the majority of our business is done with that TZ series firewall. Um, for those SMB organizations, SD branch, um, and small medium organizations. We acknowledge that not all organizations have a physical firewall anymore. You know, some might be 100% cloud. Um, so we offer, as alongside the physical hardware, a virtual firewall, NSV, so a virtual series uh, firewall. So that's there to protect your public or private cloud, whether you have Azure environments, um, KVM, um, Google, Microsoft, whatever you have, uh, that will protect it. Um, that will that will be utilised to protect that environment, and it utilises exactly the same security as it would on the on the on the physical firewall, um, just on a virtual state. You then got S uh, SMA, so secure mobile access, uh, beefed up VPN essentially. Um, you know, granular policies into um, into restrictions, policies, access in the corporate network. Um, really, really good device. We saw a big spike in, in kind of sales in SM, SMAs over the over the COVID times, making sure everyone that's working remotely is connecting in correctly um, and has secure VPN. We then cover switching um, and access points um, and a couple of other points to touch on would be our capture client. So that's our endpoint security it's built on Sentinel-1. Um, so you've got the Sentinel-1 next generation that antivirus engine alongside all of the Sonic Wall security as well. So from that perspective, you know, you've got a really, really effective endpoint uh, security tool, um, EDR capabilities, et cetera. So uh, from that perspective, you know, it's a really, really good tool. We've come up against pretty much every uh, endpoint uh, provider out there, uh, including Sentinel-1 themselves, and we beat them in terms of capture rates um, and usability, um, you know, with our UI. And you've then got the cloud application security down the bottom right. So. A prime use case for this would be an Office 365 environment. You know, if you've got an Office 365 um, you know, users, if you're uh, an Office 365 house and you haven't got that top level um, E5 um, or kind of whatever the equivalent Microsoft package is now, um, you're missing out on some on some security features. Um, and you know, we all know Microsoft is quite expensive um, if you're going for that top level uh, tier licensing. So what we do essentially is bridge, bridge the gap. If you're at a you know business premium or kind of your, your essential uh, kind of basic Office 365 licensing, we can provide an API integration into Office 365 uh, to get you up to that, you know, top level standard that uh, Microsoft can provide at a fraction of the cost. So if this is something you're interested in, obviously get in touch with uh, the guys at EBS, get in touch with Simon and Darren, um, and they can assist you moving forwards. Um, as I mentioned, all of those products can be seen through our single plane of glass management. Um, we've got Network Security Manager as the uh, as the additional layer for, for the firewalling piece, which gives you the additional reporting and analytics. But Capture Security Center will have all of your products in and from one pane of glass, you can manage your entire network. Um, so if you're, you know, if you've got lots of different uh, solutions out there and you're the, and you're struggling with kind of the management side side of things, you want to consolidate those down, you know, for complexity purposes. Um, yeah, do get in touch because we'll definitely be able to help you. And just to finish, obviously us as a vendor, as I mentioned, we've been around for 30 years. We've got a complete end-to-end -end portfolio in terms of what we can offer. So from you know your, your plans for the year, from your requirements, uh, what you've got coming up in terms of projects and what you budgeted for, um, you know, there will be something in here that we can assist you with um, and, and, we, and we can obviously provide a solution for. Um, and just obviously to finish, you know, we're a hundred percent channel. Uh, we don't go direct to, to you guys as end users. We utilize our, our resellers and our partners in the UK, including EBS, 
Um, you're a long-standing partner of Sonical. So um, as I mentioned earlier, they provide a managed service um, and are incredibly slick at what they do. Um, so do get in touch with those guys if you've got any questions. And that is really it for myself. Um, if you've got any questions, reach out to the EBS guys um, or, or reach out to myself. Um, we'll follow up with some kind of email um, email with the, uh, the threat report attached. Um, and if you've got any questions, like I mentioned, get in touch um, and we'll be able to help you out. But I hope you found that session uh, worthwhile. Back to you, Simon. Yeah, thanks, James. I, th I think that was a, a nice oversight of, of what Sonic Wall does, really. So thanks very much for that. A lot of technical stuff. Some of you may have found that useful. Some of you, it, it might have gone over your head. I think for me, th there's a few takeaways and I've also got some questions as well. Um, but I think if I really kind of bring it back to basics, uh, you must have a business level firewall and I think you know obviously we're sitting here with Sonic Wall and that's our recommendation that's what we work very closely with um, I think any of you that are sitting out there and doubting whether you've got an appropriate firewall I think the advice is to ask the question and see a what you have and, and to see if that's right for 2023 2024 and onwards really um, we still see sites that have got um, devices that I would call combo devices which are in our world, not deemed as business level products where they're a router, they're a firewall, they're this, they're that. They are fine if perhaps you've got a home network for one user, you might get away with it. Um, James might even disagree with that. Um, but but yeah, I think if you're a business, you know, I think the other thing is right at the start there, you talked about, you know, cybercrime is, it's it's a professional business. And I think that that's the way that you should think about this. It's not the the people with hoodies in a in a dark room anymore. These are you know professional people who are employed to try and compromise. The rights and wrongs of that is to a certain extent irrelevant for this discussion. It's happening, so we need to be able to 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 deal with that really. Um, and I would say, if you've got a weak environment from a security perspective, then you're vulnerable. Um, you know that they're not just attacking the big corporate um, entities it's a numbers game ultimately and if they can attack you and get in that's exactly what they'll do um so i think that that for me is the real kind of simplistic takeaway from the importance of having a firewall um 10 years ago it may not have been quite so critical but today it's absolutely critical um so yeah i think just a few questions that that i've had pop up um, here's one. I've, I have a firewall. It, it's about five years old. Um, is it good enough? So it's quite a, quite a generic statement there. Um, I, I can probably start answering that and let James, you, you probably jump in. I think um, it, it will to a certain extent depend what firewall you have. Um, it doesn't say here. Um, I would say five years old in the security world. There's been dramatic changes. It is probably an older generation if it's five years old. Um, so a later generation would be a sensible approach. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, James. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I suppose even just looking at the hardware itself, the chips, the you know the actual physical you know tin and the hardware that has a lifespan. Um, if you're not in high availability, you know if you haven't got that secondary resilient firewall there, and you're running on quite a legacy piece that you know has the potential to fall over. Um, you know, and ha doesn't have the adequate security solutions in play, you know, that's putting your business at a huge risk. Um, so, yeah, I would I would assume that's a previous generation firewall or potentially a stateful firewall. So, you know, something that you know, has a database that, you know, you'll, you'll update, um, but it doesn't do the next generation piece where it looks for those zero day and unknown threats. That's yeah. really, really important. Um, and that's what you will miss if you have that kind of legacy firewall. And as you mentioned, all of those security features, um, you know, we update it on a on a daily basis, you know, let alone five years. Right. So um, it might be that that firewall is in an active retirement mode. It's not being developed. Um, so, yeah, I definitely look to obviously get that up, uh, upgraded. Um, another one here, which uh, again, I can probably how do I know what level of firewall I need? I know there was a slide there um, with NSA's TZs, etc. Um, I, I think really the best advice is, is probably to, to to take that offline and, and it will review a number of things. Again, you may want to um, embellish on this a little, James, but I would typically look at, you know, 
how many users are in the organization, um, what connectivity speed. So at the moment, there's a big craze that people go and um, get the most connectivity speed and they're on gigabit lines, et cetera. Um, the question also has to be, is your firewall up to that? So I guess the context of that is, you know, if you've got, a, I'll, I'll use the five year old firewall, um, that probably can't deal with connectivity that you've got and therefore you're paying for connectivity of X level. You're not going to receive it because the firewall will actually, um, what's the word, that'll have a detriment to that speed as mm. much as anything. So I think size, how many people are using it? I know you talked about um, the, the likes of DPI, SSL and, and packaging yes. from that point of view that will have an effect. So I think the important thing, and perhaps what EBS can add to you from a managed service provider is making sure we scope that with you accordingly and do a fact find as much as anything. So we can touch base on that um, off, the, off the, this meeting essentially. Um, th th there is a, I, I guess there's a question that's also connected to this a little bit. Um, it's a little bit worrying this question. Um, we have a firewall. But had to turn it off as connectivity became so slow. So essentially, <laughs> don't turn it off so, so that it should be turned back on. Um, hopefully, that was a short term thing. It's probably down to the firewall not being correctly scoped. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. If it's if it's bottlenecking, if it's you know, if you're if it's scoped correctly um, for the size, for your line speeds, for all the features you're turning on. You shouldn't see a, a downturn in speeds. You shouldn't see a downturn in, you know, your day-to-day -day business um, productivity, et cetera. So from that perspective, yeah, it's probably a, a scoping piece. Um, it's probably you know, a, an old firewall, I, I would I would imagine. Um, you know, as, as I said, our generation sevens are about three times the performance. So even if you go for, you know, a low end CZ, you're still getting a very, very quick, very high performing um, uh, firewall. So yeah, from that perspective, I. I, I yeah, I, th I think I would probably read into it a little bit that it's yeah. it's probably an older firewall, um, you know, and and speed is everything these days, um, yeah. and I think um, it's probably not being correctly scoped even in its yeah. its day. And, and and equally, you know, taken away from the fact that it's turned off and you know it's a scoping piece, you're now open to everything I've just spoken about in terms of threats. Um, and as Simon said, these guys aren't just going after the the large enterprises, you know. They've got the money to implement all of the different security services and security kind of features that they they can. They've got huge budgets at their disposal. These guys are going after the SMB and mid market uh, organisations because they know you know that's where you know budgets are tight. As I mentioned earlier, there's a cybersecurity business gap. Um, you know, and that's where they're unfortunately um, kind of benefiting from the most. So, yeah, you're you're open to attacks in that sense if you turn off your firewall. Uh, uh, this this is literally just. Um, I can see, yeah. So, um, if a fire if my firewall has failed, well, there's a should stroke. Would we stop working? Um, right. That's. I, I guess there's a couple of things probably to say on that. Um, if a firewall fails, then there'll be an immediate effect to the mm -hmm. business um, because the way that it's set up and configured will prevent users being able to operate. Um, sh I guess that's the whether you would stop working. There are things that you can get around that. I guess, should you stop working? Um, I'll let you answer that, James. I think I know where I sit with that one. Um, it's difficult and to I say And I guess yes I'm talking about us, connecting. Really? It's talking about the connectivity of the network and servers, etc. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, top tier fix like make sure you know if it stopped working let's get a replacement out let's let's make sure that it's um it's replaced it's taken care of and you're back online um yeah you know, it's number I, I, one think probably, I think probably i think probably to add to that and i know you touched base on it is preventing the potential of that so we we in the our world and many people will put a level of redundancy Yes. Um, you know, for those that are technical, you'll you'll have rated server drives and things like that. You'll have backup solutions in place. Um, there is a high availability option within Sonic Wall. So literally, if there is a hardware failure with a device, and we don't we don't receive a lot of issues with hardware from Sonic Wall. That's one of the reasons we we trust and like them. But in the event that it does, 
Um, you can have a secondary device which is in high availability, um, pretty cost effective. So that can always be something as a consideration as well. Yeah, absolutely. So they're they're um, our our HK devices, which you know are literally a discounted bare box um, with a connection to the primary unit, um, are very very inexpensive to add, but incredibly important to to add at the same time. Um, you know, some of our competitors they will license both the primary and the secondary um, HA firewall, doubling the cost of the deployment, doubling the cost of the project. But you know, actually. If it fails, it's awful. You know, you as a customer shouldn't be paying twice for that. So, um, the likelihood of it failing is incredibly low. Um, our firewalls are incredibly robust, but to have that resiliency, you know, firewalls are essential for anything that you do from a from a business perspective. Um, so, to make sure they're up and running is 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 absolutely paramount. So, yeah, um, inexpensive but very important to have. You know, the other thing to say there would be what we haven't really touched on is if your firewall fails and you've got external users, you do lose your access to your VPN. So basically everybody remotely would be yep. out of action. Correct. Yeah, really good absolutely. Point. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's not only a productive a productivity piece and, and an inconvenience, it's business critical at that stage. That is all the questions. So hopefully um, it's all been beneficial to everyone. Um, thank you, James. Thank you, Darren, um, for, for organising this. Um, I guess uh, typically I'm sure you'll think of questions just as this uh, ends. If you want to uh, touch base with us, you could email hello at ebs.tech um, and we'll be more than happy to, to kind of touch base. I know there's a couple of questions. I'm going to follow up on this as well. Um, but at that point, I bring it to a close. I'd like to thank everyone for their time and uh, have a great day. Thanks, guys. Take care.